Uh, hello, everyone, uh, all around the world. So I'm not going to say good morning or good afternoon any further. Um, uh, Sebastian and I would like to welcome you all warmly to this uh, third Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar. Uh, we hope all of you are doing very well. Uh, our keynote speaker of this week is uh, Professor Thomas Dresner. Uh, Thomas is Professor at Department of Earth Sciences at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He leads research on fluid processes in the Earth crust with a focus on several applications, including hydrothermal ore deposits, geothermal systems, thermodynamics and geochemistry of hydrothermal fluids, fluid and rock mechanical interactions, reactive transport, and also stable isotope geochemistry. He is best known for the ETH numerical simulation developments for fluid flow under extreme conditions, several of which uh, were the first of their kind. Thomas received his undergraduate diploma from Technical University Klausthal in Germany and did his master's at the University of Zurich in Switzerland on a subject related to alpine metamorphic petrology. He then obtained his PhD degree from ETH Zurich in experimental and theoretical hydrothermal geochemistry. He was then a postdoc at the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Tennessee and also Oak Ridge National Laboratory with research focus on molecular modeling of supercritical hydrothermal solutions. Since 1999, he has been affiliated with the Department of Earth Sciences of ETH Zurich, first as postdoc, then senior scientist, then tenured lecturer, and finally as adjunct professor. Thomas is involved in numerous national and international research initiatives as a lead uh, PI or co-PI, including Swiss Competence Center on Energy Research and large initiatives on supercritical geothermal resources. He is currently running a group of many researchers, four postdocs, four PhDs, and five master's students on various aspects of geoscience and geoenergy applications. And this gives us all the reason to have the pleasure of hosting him as our keynote speaker in the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of this week. Please note Thomas' lecture will last for about 30 minutes and followed by questions and discussions. Like before, please type in your questions in the chat room so Sebastian will go through them one by one as time allows. Uh, Thomas, the stage is yours. Okay, I hope you can all hear me and I welcome you as well. Uh, this presentation is about, well, a super hot topic in geothermal energy. Um, these are the really so-called super hot or super critical geothermal resources. And uh, I just heard the 30 minute limit. I had planned for a bit more, so I will yeah. skip a few slides. But 31 would be okay as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I mean, 35 or so would be fine. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see. I skip a few then. <laughs> So, but what is, is an important part of this, in the background, you see the Atlas Highway power plant in Southwest Iceland. That's their biggest installation there with uh, 300 megawatts electricity being produced. And this comes from a so-called high enthalpy geothermal resource. So very hot water and steam as it collects in the underground in volcanic areas. And these magma, driven geothermal systems account for about 99% of the world's geothermally produced power. So understanding them is the key to what is currently geothermal in terms of power production. But over the last 10 or maybe so years, there, they, people discovered that underlying these conventional high enthalpy resources is an even more attractive resource which is much hotter and trying to access and, and produce it is a current hot topic in the world's sense in, in geothermal. So I will give you a bit of background on the basics with conventional high enthalpy geothermal resources. 
And then when we go to this exciting new stuff, and depending on how much time is left, we'll have a look on the challenges of how to explore for them and how to utilize in the future these super hot resources. Currently, there's not a single one that is being produced. Okay, the basics. High enthalpy geothermal systems. On the photo, you see uh, another geothermal field in Iceland. That's Krabla in the north of Iceland. And Geothermal systems are a thing that operates on land and the water that's circulating around there is basically groundwater recharged by rain and what drives the, this heated uh, uh, circulation there is the heat from a magmatic body some kilometers at depth. These things are often boiling. On the surface you see geysers etc but they also boil in the subsurface. And this actually constrains how the pressure temperature relations in the subsurface have to be. So on the bottom right, you see a typical temp temperature with depth curve. So the horizontal axis is temperature. The vertical axis is depth below the surface. So going down to about 1.5 kilometers here. And the red curve is a typical temperature distribution if you drill into the center of one of these systems. It basically follows the boiling temperature of water at the given pressure at depth. Since boiling temperature of water increases with pressure, also so does uh, this here in, in the subsurface, and this is also known as BPD, boiling point with depth, uh, be the most important curve in the subsurface of geothermal systems. What you also see, the curve steepens the deeper you go. And this basically means the deeper you drill, the less you gain for spending more money. That's why most of these fields actually don't go deeper than one to two kilometers or most of the wells. And they produce a water steam mixture at temperatures typically between 250 and 300 degrees C. Uh, just for those dealing with wells, these are typically self-flowing because you tap into something that just, if you lower the pressure in the well, it will just start. Or even if you just leave it untouched because on the top surface you have then a boundary condition that will kick this thing off. Then, unlike oil and glass, this reservoir is constantly being recharged by natural flow. And also it, uh, you have to re-inject the fluid after you pushed it through the power plant but the production rates are higher than the natural recharge, so you're basically mining the resource down there. Uh, what is also very important in many fields is that these hot fluids are very reactive uh, against the rock, and so there's a lot of chemical fluid rock interaction that modifies the chemistry of uh, the fluid, leads to scaling and all these problems. In a very, very schematic way, you can, See, uh, no, uh, as such uh, in cross section like uh, the the sketch on the right, so you have a bottom body of magma at maybe two, three, four kilometers depth. Uh, this magma is very hot and heats groundwater that's residing in the pores and fractures and the rocks surrounding it. By this, the water gets less dense, it gets buoyant, starts to rise. And unless you're in a very, very dry area, it will initiate a convection cell of uh, meteoric water circulating here, being heated in the bottom, and then rising and making this hot system here in the shallow subsurface. The conventional view conventional of this view is... Of this. The conventional view of this is that uh, of the reservoir engineers, and they don't care what is down here. Rather, ah, sorry. Rather, they're interested in these upper one to two kilometers. And a lot of technology has gone into uh, refining how to produce, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of knowledge. But there's one sort of conundrum. You produce 250 or 300 degrees, but this heat source down here is a thousand. So something you are missing by just saying, if I drill deeper, it's too costly and I don't gain anything. And so there, understanding what's down there, where nobody has drilled, uh, because 
it was too expensive to gain something. Numerical simulation is then the key tool to understand what's going on down here where we don't have direct observational uh, 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 data. So the downside is that industry standard tools are unable to do so. And so what you have to do is use uh, academic tools. This was pioneered almost 25 years ago at the USGS by Dan Heiber and Steve Ingebrigtsen in what I consider a landmark paper that's heavily undersighted, worth reading. And Sebastian and I embarked on this later on and uh, refined the whole thing a bit. In order to understand, and I go back to this, what's happening here, the heat transfer from the magma to the fluid and how the circulation happens here, how the heat is transported, the minimum first order physics that you need is you have to have multi-phase porous media flow because you will have a mixture of water and steam. And unlike oil gas things, there's a lot of thermodynamics involved because water can uh, boil off to steam, steam can condense into water, etc. And as things flow upwards, this will definitely happen. You have to account for thermal equil equilibrium between rock and fluid, etc. And you definitely need the full temperature pressure dependence of water properties to the conditions of the magma body down here. So this is a numerical uh, grid on which we have done some simple simulations. Then you have to include convection, including heat transport, and you have to include conductive heat transport down here in the heat source because there permeability is extremely low. And this was one of the landmark contributions of Dan and Steve, is to include this temperature dependence of permeability. So down here at the bottom is one of these diagrams, temperature ranging from zero to 900 degrees C, and log permeability from 100 milli Darcy at the top to basically nothing at the bottom. Uh, they assume they have quartz-rich rocks on the normal crustal strain rates, and then these start to plastically deform at 360 to 400 degrees C, which will lead to clo closure of fractures and pores, etc. So they implemented this log linear dependence of permeability on temperature. So up to 360 degrees, you have some background value, say one milli Darcy here along this line, and then permeability rapidly decreases until it's basically impermeable already at 400-ish and higher temperatures. So if you have this minimum physics in there, there's just sort of geology remaining as a parameter to be explored. And the system scale permeability is the main variable to be explored there. So this was then done, and I'll rush a bit through the slide, although it's really important. So now you have two heat transfer mechanisms. Down there at this heat source, you have conduction only because permeability is low. As you know, heat conduction is a process that's not very efficient over large length scales and short time scales. And the time scale of this year is relatively short. So once it initiates convection, the heat transfer here is pretty limited because conduction is not very efficient. And so you get now a competition between convection, which is very efficient on these large uh, spatial scales, and conduction, which is not. But this one is driving this one, so you have to see how the two actually balance. Now we, Steve and Dan, and we ran these simulations, and I show you three prototypic examples. The one on the left down here is at 10 milli Darcy, the one in the middle at 1 milli Darcy, and the one on the right at 0.1 milli Darcy um, of the background permeability of this at temperatures below 360 degrees. Again, on the horizontal axis is temperature from 0 to 400 degrees. And the vertical axis is from uh, surface down to two kilometers, basically along the center line of the simulations, just to the top of the magmatic intrusion. And the different lines and curves here show the temperature distribution 
at different stages of the evolution of the system. So let's look on the one on the left side, which has quite high permeability. So the first curve here is this one, uh, which is at a thousand years. And basically what you see there is the start of the hydrothermal, the warm water plume that's rising here. If you initiate the whole thing, then yes, you create hot water, but on the way up, it has to heat the rock that is so far relatively cool. So there is a thermal front rising up, and that's this thermal front here. So after a while, you have established the plume, and for this permeability, you see an isothermal rise at about 250 degrees, and then boiling curve on the upper 400, 500 meters. Then after a while, a few thousand years later, the heat source is basically exhausted and you see cooling of the system and then it basically dies. Okay, 250 degrees, not hotter if you have this permeability. Let me jump to the other extreme case, just two orders of magnitude lower permeability, basically nothing in groundwater hydrology makes all the difference here in geothermal. What you see for the different lines is nothing that is at all comparable to the previous case. Rather, you see the development of a conductive heat transfer uh, um, uh, mechanism. So initially, you have a strong gradient at the bottom, uh, on top of the magma body, and then you see how it more and more and more and more approximates, in the end, a linear profile, basically a steady state conductive profile. It's not perfectly linear because down here the heat source is already exhausted, so it's a slightly bent, but it's not modified or only very slightly modified by convection. So at this permeability, 0.1 millidarcy, no or very little natural convection or thermal convection is triggered by this mechanism. Not a geothermal resource at all. And then at this intermediate permeability of 1 millidarcy, you actually develop the hottest systems. They are actually boiling from the top to the bottom, all the way down during the hottest phase. And because permeability is lower than in the first case, it takes a while until the plume is established. And then you have the boiling geothermal system present for quite a while. And afterwards, when the heat source is exhausted, you actually see that the system cools from below. You have now heated the rock on the top, you have the geothermal system there, but the recharging cold groundwater has cooled the heat source, and you see these inverse thermal gradients at the bottom while the upper part is still boiling. It's quite interesting. So what this means is basically you have a limited uh, heat transfer from the magma body due to conduction, and if you have a lot of convection, what happens is you pass a lot of water past this heating zone per unit time, and so it cannot get very hot. On the other hand, if you have very low permeability here, convection is inexistent or very inefficient. So you make the little water that is passing by very hot here, but on the way up, it loses its heat to the surroundings. And basically, you establish a new conductive geotherm above the heat source. Only at intermediate permeabilities, there's the optimum. So you're fast, you're slow enough in the convection to pick up a lot of heat down here, but you're fast enough on the way up to not lose everything to the surroundings, and then you can make these very hot systems. Engineers like to put this into a pressure enthalpy diagram. So pressure is now increasing downwards here, as it does in Earth. And specific enthalpy is basically the, uh, the energy content of uh, the water that can be used to perform some work. And the three cases plot like this onto the diagram. So the first one doesn't get very hot, even close to the magma body, but then rises basically isenthalpically to the top. You see it hits the boiling area at about, uh, let's say, three. 300 bar, 30 bars, 40 bars, so the upper few hundred meters, it's just boiling inside this field. This one, the low permeability one, gets very hot at the bottom, but then on the way up loses all its energy, so not very interesting for geothermal. And this one gets relatively hot at the bottom and stays somewhere inside here, is quite energetic. 
So if you don't take any message away from this talk, this is the one you should, any other message than this one is the one you should keep in mind. There's a competition between conduction in the heat source and convection in the geothermal system. And the competition between the two is governed by the permeability in the host rock and determines the thermal style of the geothermal system. So there's also a life cycle we said already, you establish a plume, it's fully established, then the heat source cools. So yeah, in the interest of time, I proceed. Also, this was a very idealized situation. In real world situations, you have all the geologic complexity, but you could, should keep this thing in mind because there's all the thing like magma, heat conduction, and convective flow in your system as well. It may just be modified by geometries and permeabilities. All right, as I said already, there's this contrast between your geothermal resource and the top that's being exploited, 250 to 300 degrees and the heat source, let's say, at 1,000 degrees. So some 20 years ago, uh, some Icelanders came to the conclusion there must be some hot air fluid down there and plotted it also on this diagram. And as we said, conventional resources sit somewhere here. You're in the liquid plus vapor or liquid plus steam, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, zone when you produce you have this mixture on the surface you have to separate it to into vapor into steam and liquid and then you do separate with the separated fluids you do your power production if you could get to the right side of this steam plus water field and produce you see you would just rise within dry superheated steam and you wouldn't intersect it which is of course very attractive first of all the energy content of this is two to three times higher than that of conventional resources. And you could directly bring it to the surface without the need to do the separation, etc. So potentially, this could be energetically very attractive. So the Icelanders put up the Iceland deep drilling project. It started around 2000 with the first ideas. And initially, they had the idea to drill to 500 degrees C at about 300 bar. Um, just to briefly mention, this is a different representation of the water phase diagram, the conventional one, temperature on the horizontal axis, pressure on the vertical one. You see the boiling curve, which terminates in the critical point, 374, 220 bars. And at temperatures higher than that, there is no distinction between uh, liquid and steam in terms of the phase boundary anymore. You can change pressure, you go from gas or steam to liquid up here. So since there are no boundaries here, this term supercritical is very uh, poorly defined because there are no boundaries. Any boundaries you put on where you define something to be supercritical is by convention and not physics based. So in geothermal, uh, quite a few of us now prefer the term super hot because that circumvents this semantic problem. And for us, at least in the community I'm talking, is super hot means basically that the reservoir is at temperatures higher than this critical temperature and at typical reservoir pressures. That's easy to understand. Okay, let's have a look on two examples that IDDP did, the two examples they did so far. Krapla, Iceland, 2009. This is the first of the super hot wells as it was uh, standing there or the drill rig in 2009. The initial plan inspired by geophysics, if you drill down here, you would hit magma at 4.5 to 5 kilometers depth. But what happened, they drilled into magma already at two kilometers. So they, their well got stuck and they had to cut it off, deviate, got stuck again at two kilometers, third attempt, got stuck again at two kilometers, but this time, actually, unlike the first two um, uh, attempts, they actually had drill cuttings coming up. And what they found in there is essentially pumice and obsidian, so uh, um, magmatic glass, and that was quenched by the cold drilling fluid when they drilled into there. Subsequently, in the next two years, they did some circulation production corrosion tests, and these were extremely impressive. So you had 450 degrees C and 140 bars at the wellhead. 
And the flow test resulted in about 200 liters per second. So if you combine the enthalpy of this with this flow rate, you could potentially get up to 35 megawatts electricity from such a well if you can maintain it. And compare this to today's average, any of the other wells in the field typically gives three to six megawatts, maybe five megawatts. But uh, if you could do one of those, uh, it would replace maybe eight of those. So it is, in principle, very attractive. But back then, there were technical difficulties. Lots of, many parts of the installations were not rated for those conditions. They experienced heavy scaling and corrosion. So in, in the end, it had to be abandoned. Just as a little anecdote here, the videos, this is just after the well. So you see black steam coming out. Maybe I stopped the noise. I don't know if you could hear it. Black steam coming out for maybe 20, 30 minutes. And this is interpreted to be full of little rock and uh, metal shards uh, due to the violence of this uh, uh, steam, superheated steam coming out and the, uh, uh, tearing rock fragments with, with it that also then abraded uh, parts of the casing. So after then half an hour, it had uh, sort of equilibrated. You got this very clear steam coming out, uh, which is the superheated steam then and it condenses in the cold air to white water steam. We then started our numerical simulations of that using our in-house simulation platform that is one of the very, very few codes that can deal with this. And we found that mainly two parameters govern whether you can develop such a resource and how big it is and whether it's producible. This was done by Sam Scott, a PhD student back then now in Iceland. And the two parameters are on the horizontal here is the temperature at which permeability starts to decay. We call it lose the, the brittle ductile transition temperature, which is not strictly correct, but it's pretty close to what actually happens. If you have quartz rich rocks, normal strain rates, then this starts at 360 to 400 degrees. Whereas when you have basaltic rocks like in Iceland, this can happen at much higher temperatures like 450, 550 degrees C. So basically the circulating water can now reach much hotter rocks and is probably in this probably very likely favors the development of super hot resources, which are the orange areas in here. The gray one is the magma body and blue is the conventional two-phase liquid plus steam uh, uh, high enthalpy resource. Then you can play around with the background permeability of the host rock. Again, 10 milli Darcy. That was the one where we had 250 degrees on the other slide. So you see then there's a lot of water passing by, keeping the resource small. But on the other hand, natural flow rates are high here. If you go down to the 1 milli Darcy case, you get much larger resources. But then, of course, the natural flow rates are much smaller. So, but basically these two parameters, when does permeability decay and what's the background permeability determine if these occur, how big they are and what the flow rates are. Oops, sorry. So, and also what it seemed to indicate is that these resources seem to be a common element of these systems, which is good news. So we then applied the simulation to the IDTP1 well and the diagram on the bottom right basically says that yes, if you do the intrusion, put the intrusion in the simulation at two kilometers, take basalt as the host struck with these parameters and let the simulation evolve, you get this path. And believe it or not, IDDP1 without tweaking the simulation sits right on this path. And so we think we understood quite a bit of the essence of these systems with the simulation. Um, in order to keep time, I move on. What we could also do with our own code is define virtual traces. So Sam then, whenever a package of fluid was down here in the supercritical or super hot resource, he assigned it a tracer concentration of one and then followed how this package that was inside the super hot zone 
how it gets actually entrained into the overlying system. And the color code shows that it actually gets diluted by meteoric water coming in from the side. And so you can understand high enthalpy resources also as a mixture or as a dilution process of what the supercritical thing is below. Interesting for exploration because this slide implies that you could use the thermal structure of the system or the enthalpy distribution as a means to vector in into the supercritical resource when you're exploring for it. And the third one very shortly reflected what we also found in a uh, accompanying project in, at the University of Iceland. Depending what path a fluid package, basically heated groundwater, takes through the system, it chemis its chemistry will be modified such that it either becomes a normal, handable uh, geothermal fluid, or it becomes very aggressive and acid. And you see this actually in this Krapa geothermal field that very acid wells that you have to abandon after just a few days coexist with very normal, very well maintainable wells just a few hundred meters away. So if we could get towards chemistry that can be routinely implemented into these simulations, we would be able to predict where companies should drill and where they shouldn't. But this is now still a lot of development ahead of us. Then briefly, IDDB2, the second well, was drilled in 2016-17 in southwest Iceland. And it's basically where the mid-Atlantic ridge, so the plate boundary between America and Europe, comes on land. And the water that's circulating is basically seawater. They drilled to 4.6 kilometers. They didn't hit magma, but they had a very nasty zone at 3.4 kilometers because they had total fluid loss down there, no return of cuttings, and they were then blindly drilling further to 4.6 kilometers. There were a few cores taken in between. Then just after drilling, they started temperature logging, and after six days, so while drilling, this thing is heavily cooled, so you have maybe 50 degrees or so. And then after six days at the well bottom, they measured 427 degrees Celsius, 345 bars. And then the casing buckled, collapsed, and they couldn't send any probes down there anymore. So there's quite a few evidences, independent lines of evidence, that at the bottom, the actual condition is 550 degrees Celsius, or plus minus 30 or something like that. And so this is probably by far the hottest geothermal well that you can imagine. But since the casing problem is there, nothing, not much has happened since then. There's a few flow tests, back flow tests running at the moment, but it's very difficult to understand what's going, uh, what was there. Uh, this thing is complicated by the phase relations in salt water, but just in the interest of time, I skip this again. Uh, maybe one thing. Um, this is the phase diagram. You have in blue the boiling curve of water. This axis is temperature, this is pressure. And if you add salt, instead of having just a line, so adding salt is the other axis, instead of just having a line where you boil, you get this huge volume and temperature pressure composition space where uh, liquid and steam can coexist. You can precipitate salt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that also affects the hydrology of these systems. And what Sam then found is if you have a shallow intrusion, two kilometers, you will actually develop a brine pool on top of it, which is low enthalpy, low mobility, not interesting for geothermal, not in particular, not for super hot. If you have a deep intrusion, 4.5 to five kilometers, and that's probably the case in, in IDDP2, Instead, you form a, a almost dry steam that's very hot, very energetic, and very mobile. So if the well problems weren't there, we would probably encounter, would, they would probably have encountered a very interesting resource there. So understanding these things is very important for exploration and production strategies. So final few slides is on the challenges of how to explore for and utilize super hot resources. 
Okay, the resource has shifted here a bit on the slide. I don't know why, but it's basically saying under the blue conventional high enthalpy resource and just, just above the driving heat source here at the bottom, the magma body, you will develop these supercritical, super hot resources. So in principle, it should be easy, right? Just drill underneath your system and you will find the super hot resource. Well, it's not that easy at all because that's what we saw before. Remember this diagram? So here's depth, temperature, and different stages in the evolution of the system. So it basically means when you're in the main stage of the evolution of the system, yes, you have temperature ever increasing towards the heat source, and you will have a chance to find one of these things. If you're past that stage, then your conventional system still looks the same. You produce, you are happy. But if you drill a deep, drill deeper, you will actually come to cooler and cooler conditions, no super hot resource anymore. And since geothermal doesn't make so much money as hot oil and gas does, success rate for such wells will be a key criterion for exploration. And understanding these relations and finding geophysical methods to detect in what state the system is will be a key element of this. Another one on this, oops, sorry. So this is now IDDP3. This is a well that will come up in two or three years in the Hanget field in uh, Southwest Iceland. That's where the photo was taken that I had as a title slide with the biggest uh, geothermal power plant sitting right here. So the, and you see the temperature distribution at one kilometer depth. And the field goes from the north northeast to south southwest about over across about 15, 16 kilometers. That's about four to five or even more kilometers wide. So big question now, where to put this well? And of course, one could naively think, yeah, it's hot here at a kilometer depth. So maybe we should drill here or here. Now, what came up in the simulation is that the thermal structure of the field may actually be non-intuitive. For example, down here, you see a hot anomaly at one kilometer here, then a low, and then a hot zone again. It may actually be something like what we had in the two-dimensional simulation here. You had these Easter bunny ears with the head being the intrusion, the magma body. And so, these things may represent the ears somewhere here. And actually, your hottest zone would be just in between. So we are currently collaborating with Reykjavik Energy and the IDDP3 consortium. We have extended our simulation capabilities to full 3D to see if we can help constraining where the magmatic heat sources are here. And it's not trivial also from the geologic side because those may be just dikes or are they magma chambers? Are they silts, combinations? And that these geometric differences of the heat source affect what you can expect. Finally, uh, I think we are running towards the end, right, Kari? I guess so. So then I'll take this yes, as one of- we have still a few minutes, yeah, sure. Okay, so then two or three more slides. So there's options of how to use this. So one question is IDDP1 was very impressive with the 200 liters and 450 degrees. So shall we produce the stuff directly? But what we don't understand yet is if we put a well here, how will this part of the system evolve? Because what you draw in then is cold water from the site. Will this cool off this interesting reservoir and you will have to deepen the well every two years? or will it maintain more or less the temperature here? So there's projects now ongoing to do these simulations, but in order to be able to do so, you need really advanced well models in, in, in your simulator that can cope with these supercritical fluids and also with some other constraints. And I have currently two postdocs working on that to hopefully get this kind of well models uh, finally into uh, geothermal reservoir simulation. The alternative would be, Okay, you drill into the super hot zone. And as we saw before, this is part of the normal convection system in the system. So there should be uh, normal hydraulic connections to the overall overlying conventional resource that you're producing anyhow. So you could think of injecting cold water here, let it circulate into the super hot part, and by that recharge 
your conventional field. Or in other words, you would actually add a lot of hot volume to your resource and very likely could produce your system for much longer or at higher rates. Both ways would probably be economically very attractive. This injection thing is probably easier to handle on the well side. This one might be more efficient in terms of the energetics of the process. So this is ongoing research and will help us probably uh, understanding what should be done in IDP3. Okay, further challenges, chemistry. I said already there's a lot of chemical reaction between rocks and fluids uh, taking place there. And conventional high enthalpy power plants can actually, and one of the main components is silica. So conventional power plants can handle this because uh, nature helps us. Um, silica doesn't want to precipitate during the conditions of, uh, of the uh, power process there. Of course, there's a little bit ongoing, but uh, people, engineers have found out how to control this. So that's the Swartzengi power plant, also in southwest Iceland. And so it, the fluid runs through the power plant, but then it still has all the silica, which was kept in the solution due to retarded kinetics, and now it's super saturated. Legislation and also engineering wants you to re inject your geothermal fluid. But if you had the silica still in your water upon reinjection, your reinjection uh, well and the surroundings will clog within no time. So what you typically do, you have these ponds next to the power plant to let the silica precipitate and deposit, and then you take the remaining water and reinject this. So this was also done here, and people then liked this warm water, took a bath. Then later on, the company had the idea, well, let's make money out of this. And that's the famous Blue Lagoon. So people pay 50 to 60 euros a person now to swim in wastewater of this power plant. And also some of the silica waste that's um, uh, depositing here is then filled into plastic bottles and say, uh, sold as uh, uh, expensive cosmetics. So quite a good way of making money out of waste here. Now for the super hot fluids, the production of that in, or the flow tests in, in IDPP1, the thing was very different. So this is a test chamber after 14 days. And what you see here in white is deposition of amorphous silica within 14 days. And this is a response at high temperatures due to depressurization. There you basically have a very rapid kinetics and the thing just drops out of uh, the solution. The contents in the fluid are very, very low, but since you have these very high flow rates, there's a lot of mass passed through here, and then you get this deposition. How to control this is currently unknown, and the problem is we cannot model it because we have no thermodynamic formalisms that can deal with the supercritical chemistry. And to all of those who will want to try this nevertheless, this is not a problem of having the right or wrong software. It's simply we have no formulas for supercritical chemistry. So you cannot stick them into your software. This is one of the fronts of development. And we have a huge uh, European H2020 project now to work towards getting a better handle on that. I now skip all the slides on chemistry and come to the conclusions. And these are my personal conclusions from having done all this research. So what I think, and I hope I could convey this to you, is that geoscience can provide really valuable conceptual understanding of these systems. And this should be really incorporated in the planning and decision making in this, instead of just taking the engineering. And you don't master these systems by just doing business as usual, reservoir modeling and engineering. You really have to take into account what is actually ongoing and be not limited by the limitations of your tools. If they can't do it, you have to develop them. You need multidisciplinary interaction and communication. It's really crucial. You have to talk to the people, the well engineers, and how to interpret their data and to model this to geochemists, etc. And what we found here, and this is really going well now with the different companies, fundamental science is really the key for success for innovative applications in here. And you saw this supercritical chemistry, the numerical simulations, all this is really cutting edge fun science. 
I think this is one of the areas in applied or application oriented fundamental science where it's really fun because all these things come together. Yeah, so thanks for the interest and I'm happy to entertain any questions here. Thank you very much, Sebastian, it's your up. Thank you very much, Thomas, um, for the nice talk. The, pres the questions are coming in quick and fast. I'll try to keep up with them until Hani tells me we're running out of time. The first one is from Soren Pop. Um, thank you for the talk, Thomas. He has a question about the slide four where you show the, uh, the permeability as a function of temperature relationships. Right. We'd like to know if this, um, is it a sketch? Is that based on real data? Is there some law? How you model this? So this was basically invented back then from some sparse um, experimental data. And then Steve and, and Dan just introduced it this way. There's a few measurements now that were um, done in, in rock deformation labs some years back for a dolerite, so pretty close to basalt, and surprisingly, for an Icelandic one even, and surprisingly, the curve did more or less exactly what was done here. So that was very good. But then, of course, you can imagine if you have high fluid pressure, you will also produce fractures, et cetera. And uh, you may be under differential stresses, then the thing changes. But this is the best we know at the moment, unfortunately. The next question comes from Ari Eftekari, who asks, what is the bottom boundary condition, the boundary condition below the magma? Um, how does it affect the cooling? It doesn't really affect the cooling. I mean, you can do it like uh, sand did it, uh, sorry, like this here. So you put it just into an, uh, a bigger domain, make this a hot body, and you can, of course, put a higher heat flux here in there. But in terms of the heating and cooling, the, en the energy content of this body determines it all. Somewhat related to that question is um, the one from Jakob Niazi, who would like to know how, um, once the silts or dikes have intruded, how long does it, how long do they stay hot? Yeah, this depends on the size, obviously, the latent heat of crystallization, and, and so on and so on. So, uh, rule of thumb, if you have an intrusion that is a few cubic kilometers, let's say one, two, three, four, five cubic kilometers, and depending on the permeability of the whole rock, it takes a few thousand to a few 10,000 years to uh, uh, cool it down. So um, the higher the permeability, the faster the circulation here, the faster the cooling. Of course, if you got recharge of magma, then you can maintain the system for longer. Um, Nathaniel Forbes, Inskip, Inskip um so yeah, Inskip would like to know for the IDTP2 well, is there any idea what caused the permeable zone at 3.4 kilometer depth? It was so yeah, surprising. Is that a fault yes. zone, for example? Yes, this is a fault zone. Um, I don't have an image at the moment. Okay, let's bring up the slides and um, zoom in to the max. So basically, we're sitting on this peninsula. And from here, the spreading center of the mid-ocean ridge comes onto land, and you have these rift falls, these graben falls, which also convey the seawater into the system. And the speculation is that they just drilled to one of these main faults and that it was very open there. I mean, it swallowed about 60 cubic meters of, um, of drill cuttings. It swallowed thousands and thousands and thousands of cubic meters of drilling fluid, et cetera. So it must be a very uh, porous and permeable zone. There was a side discussion here on the Zoom group chat by John Ladden, um, Lorraine, uh, Salako, Jakob, and a few others, David, um, around the challenges um, of imaging the magma chamber using various geophysical tools. Um, I think that they conclude it's really challenging. Is there anything else you want to add to um, imaging magma chambers in Iceland? Yeah, we are right onto that at the moment. So because uh, there's several big European projects centering around the Hanged field where IDDP3 will be drilled. 
And there is a project called CoSeismic, that's a geothermical uh, project as far as I recall. And there is a group of EPH plus uh, Reykjavik Energy there. They installed a seismic network with about 60 stations and they're doing actually ambient noise tomography in this area. And what came out of this is some interesting anomalies. And uh, we, are just, we are in close contact since, I don't know, two, three months between the different groups to discuss if this can be pushed further to see if we find some, some particular uh, um, anomalies there that could be interpreted as either magma chambers or super hot zones. But I can't show you the, the pictures right now, the images, because that's really ongoing research and I don't want to uh, breach uh, any IPs of, of colleagues here. No problem. Um, Marcelo Benitez is asking what type of tubulars are going to be used for the completion of those wells in super crit supercritical hot conditions? What again? Sorry? What kind of tubulars so that the well designs, how do you design wells for the super hot I'm, I'm not an expert for this, uh, but this is one of the big, uh, big things because of this uh, casing collapse. That's it's, it's. There's little doubt that this was due to the enormous uh, thermal stresses there, and so now different companies have different ideas how to mitigate this. ISOR in Iceland has one flexible connection between the different parts of the well. And then WellTech has a cementless installation and whatever, but uh, I, I'm not an expert on this at all, so I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> okay. The next question is from Maji Tassanizade. Um, thanking you for a very nice talk, first of all. And he asks, it's two questions actually. So the first one is, um, you said it's a multi-phase flow problem with thermodynamics. Um, he understood that you said permeability is the most important flow parameter, but Majid would also like to know about capillary pressure saturation relationships and relative permeability, which are going to be strongly dependent on temperature and probably pressure. So how do they affect flow in the system? That's the first question. I'll let you answer this one first. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Uh, this traditionally being ignored in geothermal reservoir simulation based on some old experiments where people found that uh, capillary effects are likely negligible or small. And the second question from Majid is you mentioned assuming thermal equilibrium between water and rock. How about between liquid and gas, especially near the surface where the velocities may be higher? Uh, this is, I, I don't think there is a big issue here, but um, this is, again, because the, the velocities are not super high. It's, uh, it's sort of a Darcy flow that you have in the system. It may be higher in fractures. And you have this rock that buffers the whole thing that has been heated over a few thousand years. So how you have this uh, boiling curve with depths, rock buffer actually sitting there, thermostat at every given depth. I doubt that anybody has had a closer look onto this, but um, I also don't see in any profiles that a steam dominated reservoir with a bit of liquid has different temperatures from that, uh, from a more liquid dominated. If you take pressure into account, they all sit on the equilibrium temperature pressure relation. So there is little chance that there should be strong variations. Um, next question is from Ryan Santoso. He wonders if there's a thermal shock um, when the cold water touches the interface to the hot rock for the first time. I assume Ryan is meaning I'm referring to the drilling operations here and he wonders how you could model this and um, how it would affect the drilling operations. Uh, again, if it is drilling, it's out of my competence. <laughs> <laughs> so I shouldn't say too much about it. If it, me, if, if it was referring to the magma body intrudes and then heats the groundwater, there will be, yes, of course, some, some shock to the surrounding little bit of pore water, but overall, and there's all these studies from way back when the thermal pressurization, if you have 1% pore water or something like that, or 5%, should actually be not very impressive. I mean, of course, you get some overpressuring, but it doesn't drive the system. Next to a geochemistry question, which you're probably better, um, more comfortable answering, Thomas. The first one is from Jim Buckman, who would like to know if there are any radioactive, if anyone is checking for radioactive elements in the wastewater 
the blue lagoon that people are swimming in. I, I assume so, but this is basaltic rock, so it's very different from granite or so. So then the even the total amount of radioactive material in there should be much, much less than when you had a, a, a felsic rock. And so on prop has a second question. It says, what are we missing with the supercritical chemistry? Is it some mathematical models that are missing, experimental data? So then I have my backup slides for that. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's basically in the very physics of how the thermodynamic models were developed. So very briefly, so if, no, next slide. So what you need to calculate a chemical reaction is the free energy of uh, formation or whatever free energy of reaction for the individual uh, that comes from the free energies or chemical potentials of the individual chemical compounds involved. Typically, how you obtain this is you have some very accurate value at a reference point, which is typically in aqueous systems 25 degrees C1 bar. Then you can measure some heat capacity terms which relate to entropy. You can or find formulas to integrate them in temperature. You inter can integrate partial molar volumes and pressure, and you need to integrate an activity model if you have some significant uh, um, concentration. Now we can have a look at partial molar volumes. This is now measured at near critical pressure, so 200 bars or so. You see at ambient conditions, you have some reasonable values. You increase temperatures, they are all reasonable. And once you approach the critical point of water, they all go off. For volatiles, i.e. gases dissolved in water, it goes to plus infinity. For salts, etc., it goes to minus infinity. And I can't explain it here in detail now for time reasons, but it's physically strict that it happens like this. Now imagine you want to do the integration and you have these very steep curves. Then you're basically bound to have extremely accurate experimental data to follow the trend of the curve to get to the right value somewhere here. This is just plain impossible in terms of um, experiments. So you need a very good theory that would predict the shape of these curves. And that is basically not around. People have then done uh, some empirical sort of works in most of PT space formulas. There was this landmark work of Helges and Kirk and Flowers from the 60s to the 80s. And that's geochemist's workhorse to do these calculations. This is temperature, this is pressure, and this model that everybody uses is applicable only in the white area of the phase diagram. Where it is red, you cannot use it. And it's for the fundamental physical concept behind this model. And you see here is what we're interested in, in the deep red part. And there is a lot of theory uh, was established over the last 20 years of how one can in principle circumvent that. But um, this has not been used to, de to parameterize a large uh, data set yet. And this is one of the goals we have for this GeoPro project, uh, this Horizon 2020 thing, to get at least a nucleus for a new model that would then be able to do this. We have a good idea what the formulas should look like. You can even avoid using this divergence to plus or minus infinity. But again, that's ongoing top secret research. And once we have results, we will communicate that. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Arjan Kamp, good to see you, Arjan, here. Um, he asked, could you give some insights into the worldwide availability of super hot resources? What would be the lifetime of such a research once being exploited? Is it a niche application or is it something beyond niche? Yeah, that's the big question at the moment. So apparently in Iceland it works. Uh, everybody's confident that uh, below the third one you will also find it. So it would be three hits and three attempts. Not bad. But this was, if we are right with the governing parameters, that's also because you have the right type of rocks there. We're involved now in a big research project in New Zealand in the Taupo Volcanic Zone. They are keen to understand if they also have these. And it could very well be. They have the wrong rocks. They are quartz rich, so the brittle ductile transition should be at relatively low temperatures, but they are in an active extension zone, so you would crank up uh, the temperature at where permeability 
decreases to higher temperatures again. And the other thing is in many fields worldwide, people have accidentally drilled into these things and then just usually abandoned the wells because they were afraid they cannot maintain them and they would get hydrothermal explosions in their geothermal field, etc. So there are, some have tried to uh, utilize them, but there are examples in Italy, in Kenya, uh, what was the other one? I just forgot it. Uh, I think even in the US they drove into some. So there is potential, but it, at present it's unknown. But I think there's a pretty good chance that in many of these fields you will actually have things like this below. The question is what I said before, is the particular field still in its main stage in its life or is it already running with an exhausted heat source? Thanks. Um, Alexandros Stanilis asked, you discussed the um, interplay between the depth of the intrusion and the type of the system that forms what happens if you get magma intrusions closer to the surface? Um, do you start heating up the freshwater um, resources and could you get additional deformation caused by the intrusion close to the surface, which changes permeability? Well, well, the worst thing that can happen is you get it really close to the surface into an aquifer and then you have a phreatic explosion. So <laughs> that's that's what, what's that called then. Uh, the thing is, um, what I referred to with the depth of the intrusion was uh, a particular case for saline system systems because then the phase relations of the fluid play a major role in whether you develop the one or the other style. Well, then those that have more or less fresh water, the depth is or appears to be of secondary order unless it's very shallow, but then you also don't want to exploit it for geothermal because you might drill into things where you liberate magma or you sh uh, short circuit uh, different aquifers that are under different pressure and, you, and then you're in deep trouble. We have another well question, I'm afraid, Thomas, uh, from Hamid uh -huh. Reza um, Thanking you for a great presentation. He, said, he asked, um, what are the usual well stimulation techniques for geothermal wells? You don't need to stimulate. I mean, sometimes they have that some, some cuttings or so might clock some feed zones. What they then do is they pour cold water in and that has a, uh, makes the rock thermally contract, open the cracks there again, and then these cuttings fall out. That's at least the interpretation of what happens. But usually these types of geothermal wells don't have to be stimulated. Two more questions. A lot of uh, additional moments where people get really excited about possible research opportunities. Um, Maren Bremer also thanks you for the nice talk and asked, what is the reason of asset and neutral wells being so close to each other and still so different in chemistry? Yeah, so this is a bit more involved. In, in a nutshell, when you have the super hot fluids, then water is a medium that has a very low dielectric constant. So if you have HCl, um, hydrochloric acid in there, for example, it forms a neutral molecule because the hydrogen and the chloride will stick together. And now it depends uh, where, and typically these deep hot fluids have very little concentrations of that, so they should be not a problem. But then on the way up, if they condense into a more liquid dominated part of the system, you, you tend to accumulate this hydrochloric acid it becomes cooler and then water get, the water dielectric constant increases again and HCl will dissociate into H plus and Cl minus and then it's aggressive. And it appears as if it depends on the part, the path of the fluid, whether this accumulation and dissociation will happen in larger or smaller amounts. Again, this is limited, modeling this is limited by our current lack of a thermodynamic formalism for the, for the very hot stuff. So it's, it's very difficult to, how, how to say, to, to fake a reaction path for these fluids. But our Icelandic colleagues found a, a rough way of how to get at least close to something that makes thermodynamically sense and is defendable, and they came up with this conclusion. Um, so just John Ludden asks, your conclusions show that we need a significant research initiative which works at the at near the magma interface. Can we combine the Kraffler test bed and three in some large field pilots? 
I don't know. I mean, Krapla test bed, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still undecided when, because the focus there is unclear. I mean, it must probably be, it would have to go beyond the Krapla test bed to be able to monitor where the actual fluid flow is going, et cetera. But I, I very much like the idea of that initiative to better understand the interface between the actual still partially or largely molten part and this transition zone, this carapace of largely crystallized into a ductile zone surrounding it and then potentially into the uh, geothermal system there. So yes, that would be a super nucleus for such a research initiative. And there is a lot ongoing, but I think just bringing together, as I said, multidisciplinary, the different uh, families of research there would be a super thing. Um, there's one final question I need to pass this on because it goes back to my PhD with you, Thomas. Um, <laughs> Mareles asks, are you solving for enthalpy or temperature? Could you elaborate on your choice? A again, what? I, sorry, did you catch the question? There was something with enthalpy and ter uh, temperature. It was just a few words. Are you solving for enthalpy or temperature? Could you yes, elaborate? Yes, we're solving for, for enthalpy, obviously, because if you have temperature, you cannot decide how much steam you get. You need an energy value. And then you can uh, simulate the fraction of steam that you get based on, on uh, change in pressure or so. Um, what people often, and us, including us, are often missing is a few terms that were considered insignificant, like pressure volume work terms, et cetera. Um, for example, if you have, are in the recharge zone, then this is not uh, very important. But if you're in the upflow where you have the boiling, et cetera, this is important. But generally, yes, enthalpy is the thing to solve for. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I pass back to Hardy for some closing remarks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, both of you, uh, Thomas and Sebastian. I need to uh, announce the next talk and wish everybody uh, all the best. Uh, I would try to see if I can share my screen in a moment to everyone. I hope you can see my, my screen. Yes, so the next speaker next week, the same time would be Matt Jackson from Imperial College, and he will talk about controlled salinity, water flooding, a micro to macro scale mystery. So please uh, join us next week. And thank you again, Thomas, for a very inspiring talk. And we wish you all the very best and see you next week.